be great. And, um, you know, I'm expecting this to trigger some discussion. So I'm going to follow up with sessions for the faculty, staff and graduate students in a week or so. Okay, so um, let me just get on here. So you know that uh, from the emails that you've been receiving that although I'm head of department, uh, there have been essentially three leaders over certainly the last six months. And I want to thank Dean and Anthony for all of their hard work. And, uh, you know, without that hard work, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so this is my third state of the department. <laughs> and uh, every year I've shown this slide, hopefully it's a joke. Um, you might be thinking that finally this joke has got into reality and I'm hoping today to convince you that that is not the case. And that, that's remarkable given that this year, 2020, has thrown all sorts of things at us. You know, pandemic, budget crisis, social injustices, wildfires, and it's not finished with us yet. We have the election and who knows what's coming down the line. Uh, but we have absorbed it. And my message today to you is one um, that, you know, I'm scanning that horizon and uh, I'm not seeing a cliff or a waterfall and going over that edge in terms of finances. Of course, you'll be asking, well, Richard, how far can you see? And so I'll be telling you timelines associated with that. And the other big message is that we are excelling as usual in our teaching and in our research. Uh, so a little bit more of a peaceful sort of thing here. So uh, we didn't go over the edge in the spring and many reasons for that, but the main reason is you, the undergraduates, the graduates, the faculty and the staff, you all brought considerable talent and considerable emotional energy and hard work uh, to the situation. I'm not expecting, of course, that your talents will disappear because we should be concerned about you running out of emotional energy. So one of the challenges, finding a steady state that's sustainable for us to make our way um, through the coming times. Um, I want to offer an analogy. Um, I'll get this right in a minute. Um, and it's... Um, it's not a particularly close analogy, but I think it's one that helps me and hopefully it helps you. So if we go back to the moon mission, of course, one of the great achievements of America and could only have occurred in America. So you know the story that in 1962, Kennedy announced that uh, they were going to, NASA was going to put somebody on the moon by the end of the decade. And July 1969, Apollo 11 landed and then December of that year, Apollo 12 landed. So remarkable event. Um, um, what about the first um, 10 Apollo missions? Because not everybody talks about those. In particular, what about Apollo 1? Why, why isn't anyone talking about that? Because that surely would have been the first stepping stone of Kennedy's vision. Well, Apollo 1 didn't even launch in January 1967 these three astronauts perished in a fire on the pad. So not only was that a, a personal tragedy, but that was close to a national disaster. But then we skipped two years, two short years, to July 1969, when they put 11 on the moon. Now, looking back at that time, no one in NASA would have said, hey, um, you know, they would have done anything to avoid that disaster in 1967, but they did learn from it. And everybody in NASA acknowledged that it was that learning from that disaster that actually allowed them to get to the moon in 1969. So we can learn quite a lot from that. We are not happy with the pandemic and all of these circumstances, but they are with us and we can learn from them. And in particular, NASA noted at the time that they were paying so much uh, focus on their long-term vision that they weren't really looking at all of the details right in front of them. And so I think that it's not that we should take our eyes off our long-term vision. We know what it is. But for the moment, we should concentrate on the details right in front of us. Uh, we should, um, if there's anything that we can see that is wrong, this is a great opportunity for us to fix it. But we should strip everything down, 
rebuild it, concentrating on the things that we really want to do right now. Now, of course, we can't do that on an individual basis. It's not that we want to turn up every day and say, oh, I can't be bothered to do this or that. We have to do a co coordinated approach. And of course, the college is asking us to do exactly that. So today I'll be giving you sort of like a dream list of, of things that we could do, but then we've got to go through the series of business of thinking out, okay, but what can we actually achieve right now? So what can you do? Okay, so uh, the, the, the term ahead, probably the most important thing that you can do in, in terms of the nation, its impact on our university, and then of course our impact on the department is for you to vote. It's gonna have a profound effect You've got two candidates with very different visions. So obviously I'm not gonna tell you which way to vote, but you should vote. The second thing is let's not assume that this is going to be a smooth transition, no matter what the result. So please don't hold a midterm. It's gonna be week six, um, Tuesday is election day. So don't hold a midterm or anything significant around that time. So let's go a little closer to home. Let's look at the budget. And of course, I have to warn you that um, this is not the uplifting part of the talk, but I'm hoping that you will appreciate the honesty and hopefully the clarity. So this is a slide from um, two years ago, and you can see I had uh, four bags of cash and a big smile on my face. Um, let me remind you of one thing, though, that the, the university is not in the business of making a staggering profit. It's not that we're trying to grab as much money off the students as we can. So that means that we're never going to be deeply into the black. And so just matter of routine, we're going to be right at that interface under usual circumstances between the black and the red. So we shouldn't panic if a challenge comes along and flings us into the red. Of course, it's going to do that but we have to manage the situation. The second thing is, of course, relative to our personal bank accounts, our university is a massive business. So when we go into the red, we go into the red by big numbers. And so that's my sort of English polite way of saying, get ready to see some big red numbers in the coming slides. But if we concentrate on our department, we're actually doing very well right now. And of course I've got to, you know, very well is all within context. Uh, so our operating cost every year is about 8.3 million. And right now we have a, a balanced budget. So everybody is funded all the way through to the first years uh, next summer. Okay, so that's the really good news. The reason why I'm not going to go line by line through our budget is because that's not where all of the drama is going to take place. The drama will occur at the university level. So let's have a look at this. So this is a slide that I took from my talk this time last year. So a number of department heads had just met with President Schill and he noticed the following. Okay, so the obvious thing that our, our university is tuition driven. And he noted, of course, that uh, in the era where parents and students are starting to question the value of university education, we need enrollments to go up. And what he noted this time last year is financially, we will be able to just weather, survive the next five to 10 years if we can attract more students. And this time last year, we were expecting our largest incoming class in history, about 4,500. So what about this year? Okay, well, the provost is expecting our continuing, our returning student numbers to be fairly robust. What about incoming students? So we have to look at our comparator uh, universities, one of which, for example, is uh, Boulder. So they experienced a 10% drop in incoming students. If that happens to us, then that will represent a $15 million loss in tuition. And of course, that very much depends on the ratio of in-state to out-of-state because in-state students pay less tuition. For example, if we look at the University of Arizona, their coming, incoming student numbers are up, but their profit is down because of a shift to in-state students. So things will become a lot clearer in November when the penalties for withdrawing kick in. But potentially we're looking at about a 50 million drop across the academic year. So that's 50 million out of our sort of annual academic operating budget of 550 million. 
Richard, can I ask a question? Yeah, I'd actually prefer Hello. if you wait to the end, because I, I want to make sure that I get a whole lot of facts out for you. And I might answer some of your things if we, uh, you know, as I go down the road. So uh, fire away now, but I'd prefer uh, to wait. Okay, so <laughs> in all of these, these discuss discussions, nobody seems to talk about the fact that the university has a $1 billion endowment. Why is yeah. that? Um, so that's a, that's a great question. I think it's a question of uh, when do you want to touch that and uh, under what circumstances. So let me go on a few slides and you'll see certain numbers about where if we don't do certain things where they'll have to consider uh, dipping into various other options. Uh, so hopefully I'll get to that. So, so that's tuition. Um, if we go back to the spring, so we had a $4 million uh, loss in tuition, but we did have approaching a $20 million loss in, in the auxiliary budget. So the auxiliary budget is the cost of actually running things like the library, the EMU, the rec center, and things like that. You remember the reason why that accumulated is because students weren't using those facilities and they actually gave all the fees back to the students. So hopefully if we've got students on campus and we don't go into another lockdown, the auxiliary budget won't take as big a hit. Uh, remember always that athletics is separate, that we've got, a, you know, we're unusual for a university that there's a financial war between our academic budget and our athletics budget. And certainly talking to the provost two, years ago, two weeks ago, there's no hint of, of any bailouts or whatever. So until recently, that was uh, the athletics was predicted to get a $50 million hit. But as you've seen in the meantime, then the president has announced that uh, some sports will be ramping up again. So that's money associated with tuition. But of course, we do have to go to the state. The state does fund some of our operation. So this, again, is a slide that I showed in the talk last year uh, from the meeting from the president. So um, the president declared that OSU is, in his words, eating our lunch. What he meant by that is that OSU receives about $100 million more each year from the state. Um, and that's in part because of STEM education. And of course, that's part of the reason uh, why we need the night campus. The reason why I'm showing you this slide is that the president at that stage was saying that he would have to go and lobby to increase our state funding to help weather the situation. So obviously that's not gonna happen this year uh, and not next, that we can't expect the state to give us even more money. Um, the remarkable thing is that in early summer is that the state didn't cut any higher education. And so that was really good news. That, that wasn't clear in April that that was gonna happen. So the, our next check-in on that is early next summer, where we might look at a possible 17% cut. And of course, that all depends on the economy and the stock market, and who knows what's going on. Remember what that is, though. So in a typical normal year, the state would contribute around about 7 or 8% to our operational budget. So this is a 17% cut on that 7% contribution. So we can expect some sort of movement and swirling around of the finances over the next year. So normally what would happen is that money would come in centrally in the provost's office, and then it would get distributed to the colleges and then to the departments. We can expect the opposite this next year. The debt is going to accumulate centrally because of the tuition, the lack of tuition dollars coming in. But at the meantime, it will be at the department level that will be saving. And so we can expect that the provost and the deans will come knocking at some point for some money. So in a typical year, if we look at what happens in our department, we have about up to about 90K discretionary funds. Um, it's not really discretionary because we have to pay it on fairly vital things like colloquia, travel, recruitment, lab equipment, and things like that. But if you look at our current situation, of course, these are all savings. You know, we're not traveling as much, colloquia are not costing, you know, recruitment costs a lot less. So, so we're saving at the time when centrally 
they have not got as much money. So we can expect someone to come knocking. We can see it already that in terms of our summer profits, um, the ratio that we can keep is being adjusted and that's very much in flux, how much of the summer we'll keep. Carry forward, normally we're allowed to carry forward some savings into the next year. I think we can expect that to go away in the future. Uh, ASA accounts, right? Things like that could well be paused. Um, and, and that's a great example of how uh, the college can save. So we each get, each faculty member gets $1,500 uh, in a, a, an ASA account to spend on your career development. But if you add those up, if the college pauses those, then they save $750,000. Um, so, so a lot of money. So small little savings add up. So what, what are we going to do about it? Um, and I think this gets to John's point. Um, so this is an email that went out around about mid-August to the faculty announcing that there had been an agreement between the union and the university. So if you remember, there was a, a period where, um, I think I can use this language in a way, our career uh, faculty were held hostage and the FTEs were temporarily reduced. I think that that was a disastrous thing to do for our climate because our career uh, faculty are extremely valuable to us. But good news kind of came out of that. And that's what I mean when I say maybe we can take advantage of, of some of these situations. So um, we, we, the university has learned from that lesson. And so there is going to be a shift now away from our career faculty having uh, contracts that have to be renewed to the expectation of continued employment. And that will kick in um, next summer. And, and no one's quite clear about uh, what that will look like. But that will mean that uh, we're all in the same boat together. And that is fantastic news. So being in that boat together, what we've decided to do, which is uh, really was, is needed, is that rather than picking individuals and say you're going to lose your job, we have agreed to take a cut in salary. From what I'm hearing, I'm sorry, Richard, I'm I'm sorry, I can't let this go. Yeah. That's a choice. The university has decided that cutting our salary is less painful than cutting into their one billion dollar endowment. Right. Right. That's a decision that I. Why aren't, aren't we objecting to that? Right. So if we look down, sorry, let me go back one. So the I wasn't in the negotiations, right? So that, that was your that was the union negotiating with um, with the university. But look at that bottom line, right? That they're only allowed to do this up to twenty million dollars of savings, and then they've got to look elsewhere. And so that's going to be a big. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, John. That at some point, that so they are thinking right now based on. Um, the numbers that this may not at least won't kick in in November this year, but it might have to kick in next summer. And then they will be allowed through those negotiations to go up to 20 million. Then they've got to figure out what to do beyond that. And that might be where they start to ask these questions. Why, why that wasn't in the negotiations, I, that's really beyond my level of knowing. So it's not surprising though, that, um, that this would happen, right? That 88% of the budget, of our operating budget is in salaries. So it's not surprising that this would be the maneuver. So um, I think that we will get pay cuts kicking in next summer. And then of course, we've got a hiring freeze as well. Uh, so we're not bringing anybody extra in. So let's turn to our staff. And th this is a, a beautiful photograph of the staff. And this was actually during uh, Tiffany's award ceremony for outstanding staff member. Let's, let's look at um, the staff uh, as we knew it this time last year. And I I'll go one by one. So Anthony uh, has been absolutely amazing in helping through this time. Anthony last week moved to Northern Michigan to be uh, closer to his family. For stability, we have agreed uh, that Anthony will work remotely for, uh, up till the end of this next academic year, and then we will revisit the situation. 
I'm absolutely confident that this can work. Um, it's worked over the last six months. I think that Anthony and I have maybe met two times in person over the last six months and we've worked very effectively remotely. So please bear in mind though, that he is uh, three hours ahead. So it's uh, 20 past seven, his time now. Hopefully he's just put the kids to bed. Okay, so um, next summer, if Anthony decides to move on, um, then we will replace that position. Jody, of course, absolutely amazing person has worked so hard for us. She saw an attractive position, equivalent position in the night campus and went over there. Jody's position because of the hiring freeze will not be replaced. Jenny has worked for us for 41 years through 12 or maybe even 14, I think it's 12 department heads and I might have just finished her off. Uh, so Jenny has uh, just retired now. She's agreed to work a, a couple of extra months. Um, it's not clear right now, but Jenny, Jenny might be replaced. Uh, half of the Jenny position might be replaced. So we're losing one and a half positions. So you can imagine that that puts Janice, Amanda, and Tiffany under a, a huge amount of stress. And she was, they were already stressed anyway. So what I want you to remember is remember that they are here to help you in your mission. It's not the other way around. So please help them to help you, right? So any communications, please be effective with them. So we've painted a picture so far of, um, you know, we've got a budget strain, we've got staff resource strain, and then of course we've got the general strain, right? That we just look at a photo like this, and our mission is very much a human one. And as much as we, you know, can tolerate Zoom, it's not the same as these good old days, right? So things are gonna be unusual. We can see that from uh, commencement, right? Usually commencement is a great affair with uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. And you can see me filming my commencement speech there, so really odd. And you know, how do I judge whether commencement was successful or not? Well, I managed to steal a roll of toilet paper, you know, and that was, uh, that was good at the time. So, so very weird, weird times. And then of course, more recently, we've had the wildfires and here's a photo of my niece actually putting out the fires. And then equally, there's a, a photo of these massive air scrapers in Willamette cleaning all the air so that we can actually work in Willamette Hall. So, you know, very weird times. Um, but what I want to emphasize to you, of course, we don't know. I don't even know what normal means and I don't know the time scale. But I am convinced that one day we will get back to something definitely more um, normal than we have right now. And so, you know, and we're planning for it. So I just want to mention a couple of things, you know, so Scott has been doing great in terms of getting funding in for Pine Mountain, some of which is for beaming remote images from Pine Mountain into Willamette Hall. Chris Hendon now has his funding for the uh, chemistry coffee shop, which will go into Willamette. So one day I really look forward to actually seeing you in Willamette where we can have that free cup of coffee and watch these amazing images coming in. Of course, we didn't get our infamous sort of talent contest this year either. So hopefully we will get back to wanton mechanics again. And who knows, maybe in March, we will actually be able to look at, go and see Jim Schombert at the Eugene Science Center, where he'll be talking about heavenly bodies accompanied by a piano. So we are gonna get back to normality at some point. So I'm not promising you a, a walk along a beach and a drink of uh, whatever that is, tequila or whatever. But remember the things that I've talked about so far, turning the wheels, the mechanics of the wheels, we should care why we are actually turning those wheels. And so now I wanna shift to the more uplifting part of the talk about our mission and you know, how that is going. So here's our department has uh, the numbers haven't shifted that much from uh, other years. So I'll be going step by step. So let's um, have a look at faculty. So here's Brian looking very casual and smiling. So Brian is uh, coming up for promotion to full professor and we'll be giving a talk next week. Um, 
Let's look at uh, new arrivals or big impacts, whatever you want to call it. David Alcock, of course, has been on our uh, books for a year now, but David now is very much uh, on the scene. I've seen him a number of times. And, uh, you know, his lab is now built. And uh, that I know was a very challenging time for David. So thank you for sticking with that, David. Um, David Strom, always a pleasure to have David back. I walk past his house twice a day, so it's good to have him back. Stan is back from Lund from collecting um, his honorary doctorate and uh, uh, being on sabbatical for a year. And we'll be here, I'll be telling you about Stan's uh, summer session work. Uh, Giant thinking big. So Giant is a fantastic teacher. He's not taught for a while, and now this week he is uh, teaching general physics with Stan. So uh, I know he's very excited about that. In terms of faculty away, so Laura uh, for fall and winter is at CERN. Stephanie, of course, is in her new journey as a mother, and so um, is doing some research still in the fall, but no teaching. Uh, Stephen, look how so young and refreshed after a couple of months of being on sabbatical, Stephen looks. And uh, David will be back at CERN uh, in the spring and the summer. I want to say a special word for Elsa Johnson. Elsa is no longer with us uh, because of the previous uh, budget situation. Um, just a remarkable character. On the day that I contacted, Zoomed her to talk to her about that issue, she was more concerned about her students than myself. And I know that we have all known Elsa in many capacities and just a remarkable, talented, enthusiastic person. And I talked to her this week and, and she is doing very well, but uh, she will be missed, that's for sure. This last year, we introduced 15 affiliated faculty from biology, chemistry, earth sciences, night campus, and mathematics. So remember, the distinction there is, of course, anyone can teach for us. The, the affiliated faculty, though, are allowed to be the advisors of our PhD students. So that's a great way of expanding our influence and our mission and increasing the numbers of uh, graduate students that we can support. So turning to our graduate students, so we've got 26 graduate students coming in, uh, so many that we can't fit them on the same page. So 26 incoming. If we combine that with the 14 who are going into uh, their second year, then uh, the mathematics tell us that. That's 40 students out of 90. So almost 50% of our graduate students are in their first or second year. So that's a, a very healthy situation. Part of the reason for that is this historic successful number of, of successful uh, uh, defenses. And uh, I can't quite add them up right now, but I think it's 25 or 26. And uh, well, we'll be returning to this, but of course this is all to do with the improvements in our graduate program and speeding up the time to graduation. In terms of postdocs, you can see a, a couple of uh, familiar faces here. In particular, I've enjoyed working with uh, Jason and Sabah. And many of us will know uh, Johan Walter, who was always uh, a joy to work with in the demo room. So let's uh, get on to research. Let's look at our research uh, figures. So this is plotting uh, research expenses. So remember that that lags awards. Uh, so we're kind of at our sort of steady state of about 6 million. And of course, uh, about 1 million of that is uh, startup and internal funds. Um, so of course, the, the, the rise around about 2011 and 12 was due to the Obama stimulus package. So that's why it was so high there. So we're sort of at the moment green being now uh, we're, we're hitting uh, what we've been doing recently. Um, as you know, our research is handled by institutes and uh, the Institute of Theoretical Sciences is, is no longer with us and no doubt will rest in peace. But there is a new institute that the Center for High Energy Physics has combined with ITS to create uh, the Institute for Fundamental Science. And uh, Graham, you can tell that that's pre-COVID because uh, Graham's got his wild, crazy COVID hair these days. So Graham is the director of that. Uh, Brian has just taken over from Stephen to be director of OMQ. 
And Darren, chemistry professor, took over directorship of the MSI from me uh, two years ago. If we look at I IFS, uh, let's have a look at the numbers by a unit. Uh, so you can see those numbers. And then, of course, uh, MSI has a lot of chemistry uh, professors, and so their total spending is about $5 million. Um, in terms of IFS, um, I want to congratulate the LIGO team for all of the black holes uh, that they've been discovering recently. I do want to point out that we need to locate one more black hole, and that's the financial black hole. Uh, th this situation has been getting bigger each year, and um, we really have to sort it out. You know, um, how is it that our institutes can have so much income and be so close to the edge in terms of their running? And I know that Anthony and myself and um, Dietrich and Stephen have been working on this for a while, but this is one of these opportunities where we really need to make sure that our institutes are not falling between the cracks, the cracks between our college and the Office of the Vice President of Research. Because clearly our institutes are very important to our culture. So going, going ahead, you know, our research is going to be unusual for Ryle. So uh, there on the left, we can see High Lynn sort of reclining outside during a recent group meeting. And Philip in um, Ragu's uh, group sporting a beautiful red pullover and a cell phone attached to his head where he's using that to uh, broadcast uh, what he's doing in the lab out to the other students so that they can learn. So, you know, un unusual times. And of course, now we've got the night campus, so we don't have to use the artistic rendition anymore. Uh, so this is now opening. This was a photograph from two years, two weeks ago, sorry. So this is Bruce Ardeen on the left and Bob, the director of the night campus on the right. I do want to point out the fractal carpets. I mentioned this in my talk last uh, year that I'm working with Mohawk um, to generate stress reducing carpets. Uh, they've been bought by Google and Microsoft and universities such as the Knight Campus. So our research shows that if you look at those, you should expect to have your physiological stress levels reduced by up to 60%. So if you're feeling stressed, just walk over to the Knight Campus and see if it actually happens. John, um, I Googled John Toner and I got these two images and um, I think the left hand one might be uh, John's father, I don't know, but the right, the right one is definitely John. So John, of course, won the Ansaga Prize um, and by an epic uh, piece of work that really inspired me. The idea of using Applying fluid dynamics to living elements is just fantastic. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed that when it came out. And of course, the, the, it, it's flocking theory of, of the way that the birds move around. And of course, our local connection is twice a year, we see those swifts come into that chimney on agate and, and follow John's beautiful equations. The other connection we've met with uh, here, of course, is that it was our own Russ Donnelly who started the Ansaga Prize in 1993. Tian Tian, a little frustrated that she's not been running any marathons recently, but um, I think that this New Horizons Prize more, you know, makes up for that. And Ragu, of course, recently got uh, the upgraded to an APS fellow for uh, what we know about him being very creative and innovative. And um, I just want to show you this slide of all of the great things that have been unfolding in our quantum mission. And the last couple of slides were not meant to be sort of comprehensive. They're just a quick grab of what came into my mind Tuesday afternoon in terms of what I could show. And so that's just representative of all of the great things that are going on. So let's um, turn to our climate and diversity committee. So it, it has a new name. It was previously diversity committee. And that's not just window dressing. That is because we can see that we've got a number of opportunities that we can seize to improve our climate. So it, it's chaired by Giant and Spencer, and they've already, as you know, been working hard through the summer. Um, I am not on the committee, but I've been attending all of the meetings. And in addition, we have one uh, undergraduate rep and three student reps who've been working 
very hard so far. The one thing that I want to emphasize before we go into what we're doing is that when we're not in a bubble, that we are within this university and the university is rapidly developing these resources that we can tune into. So I just want to show you uh, a recent email from uh, our colleague Dean and highlighted in red a few things that they're doing. So they're launching a black studies program. They have committed to hire more black tenure track faculty. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there are Dean's diversity grants um, and there's gonna be a focus on addressing the systemic discrimination towards black people on the campus. They, the college is committed to work with our departments, the STEM departments to close the achievement gap. And I'll talk to you in a moment about that. And then they are going to work with faculty to develop new courses and curricula. So even beyond our department, there's a background of a whole lot of things uh, that are going to be going on. Through the summer, I had an, a number of useful conversations with Yvette, who's the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. One of the discussions is, I know that many of you are very um, enthusiastic about a climate survey. Um, you know, the worst thing that we could have done is uh, push forward a very clumsy local uh, survey. So she has promised it was it was coming definitely pre-COVID. It's still coming. It's going to be a, a campus-wide uh, survey, but it's going to have specifics to do with departments. So that's definitely going coming on. But the main message from her is, you know, that we don't have to wait for that. We know things that we can do. We know best practices that we can really uh, instigate. For me, uh, what I found really useful was this AIP team up self assessment rubric. And I, I sent it to the faculty and the uh, diversity committee are gonna return to that, go through it and then engage with the faculty. So basically though, it has three stages to it, emerging, developing and transforming. And then it goes through all of the different activities and describes what's going on. Um, so stage one, for example, reminds me very much of sort of like 1980s physics department that I did a PhD in. And simply, you just ask yourself the question, um, where do you think we are as a department? And where would you like us to be? And where do you think we can get given our current resources? I found it very uh, illuminating. And so we will be returning to that uh, soon. One of the things, of course, is our, our code of conduct, uh, which is incredibly important. You could have asked me 10 years ago, do we need this? And I'd say, well, surely this is obvious. We don't have to say that. With all of the things going on, we definitely need this code of conduct. We need an expression that we care about each other and that everybody's success contributes to our success. Um, I want to thank everybody who helped with this code of conduct. I, I particularly appreciated an email from Eric Corwin um, about a story that pointed out that a typical time that it takes to get your first code of conduct out is seven months. And we haven't got seven months. And so that's why we went simple and straightforward. And the idea is that now what we can do, having got this out, we can provide links and gradually develop the context behind it. So when we say we pledge, what do we mean by that? Behaving respectively, what do we mean by that? So we can develop all of these things, but the most important thing was just to get this code of conduct out, which we have done. We have been working uh, with the uh, U of O ombuds, Brett, particularly myself and Anthony, and James I thank a lot because I had a lot of conversations with James over the summer. He's been working very hard. And one of the things is to form this local panel for effectively addressing personnel issues. And a lot of departments have this. Uh, we do need this. Um, and basically everyone will get to nominate who they want to be on it. And so in the coming weeks, we've just got to decide uh, what, what the sort of look of ratios of graduate students to professors will be on that. The second thing that we uh, have got to, and this is all to do with preventing an acceleration of an issue. But the second thing is we do, and it's not us, all departments have to do this. We have to more effectively engage with the university resources. And I've pestered everybody and a whole set of people have ensured that there are changes going on 
in the Office of Investigation of Civil Rights Compliance, which is where the processes go through, to make them faster and make them more transparent. We've successfully applied for three Rehearsals for Life uh, workshops. Uh, we can choose what they are like, and so we can get input from the faculty and the staff and the graduate students to create the workshops that we want. In addition, two weeks ago at the Provost workshop, it was announced that there will be three training modules for faculty. Um, I don't know anything beyond that other than they are required, and that is to work through climate issues. So I'll be filling you in on that a lot more. But basically, although our diversity committee is big and it meets with all of the diversity committees quarterly uh, through the college, we can't rely solely on the diversity committee for something so important and because the workload is gonna be big. So we have to engage all of the different committees to have this cross sort of uh, committee collaboration. And we've already started uh, to have those conversations with the chairs of the other committees and the directors. But one thing that we've really got to go for, and, and it is work, and so, but we've got to do it, is next March, we do have to apply to the APS Bridge Program. And there's two levels that we can apply, is membership and partnership. I really want us to get to partnership in the coming years. So what that is aimed at is attracting supporting PhDs from underrepresented groups. The way that it does it is that the APS will actually supply us with funds and mentoring advice to make sure that we retain these students. And if we can demonstrate that, then we get access to a pool of potential applicants. And that's, we can't not let that opportunity just pass by. We've got to go for this. On the undergraduate level, we've already started to have some discussions with Lane Community College to see what we can do about diversity at the undergraduate level. We've dedicated three GE positions to graduate student projects um, to boost DEI. Uh, those, uh, we got three applications and those are being considered by the diversity committee right now. You might say, well, three GE lines is, is not that big and I completely agree with you. But within the current context of making sure everybody is funded, that is quite a, a big contribution. I really want to emphasize that we should make use of resources that we've already got. We can redirect resources to what we want to do. So uh, Colloquium is a great example. So John is the full uh, organizer, then we've got Spencer, and then we've got Giant. So, you know, you, you can tell all these people what, what sort of a speaker do you want? And look at, this is what, uh, you know, John has done for us. The four women, three African-American, one Asian, one Asian American. And the reason why we want to hear it from them, because they are fantastic scholars. And we have a whole host of things that we can tune into. You know, I've got women in graduate science, but I should be probably showing women in physics, you know, and, you know, SACNAS, we, you know, the MSI donated $5,000 in 2018. It's a lot easier now to go to these remote conferences. So we should grab hold of all of the resources. The Long Range Planning Committee, that has been meeting for the last year, chaired by Giant, um, looking at uh, opportunity hires amongst other things. And although we've got a hiring freeze on, the, the opportunity hires for young, excellent black uh, potential uh, faculty is, is, is happening, we can go for that. And so we're trying to uh, come up with a list and there was a meeting between, I've been hammering away on Hal, our divisional dean. There was a meeting between Hal and the provost on Tuesday, so he should be telling us uh, what's going on. So, you know, in terms of opportunity hires, watch this space. Graduate admissions committee and graduate recruitment committee, we've got uh, uh, appropriate numbers of student reps on that, so please be interactive. Let's have a look at some numbers there. So this is our usual roller coaster, right? So you can see this year we've got 26. Uh, you know, we're thinking about a target of 20 per year. Who knows what's gonna happen, but if you're tempted to think we should be ramping down, maybe we shouldn't be, 
uh, if you look at that left hand side, you can see the ratio of number of uh, doctoral students to each professor. So 2015, it was 3.3. Currently, it's 2.6. So if we want to maintain even sort of, you know, um, status quo, uh, then we want to be bringing in big classes. And on the right there, the sort of ratio of GEs in terms of how much is research and how much is um, in terms of teaching assistance. This is um, a table given to me by Eric Torrance, who is the previous chair of admissions. I want you to just concentrate on the red for this slide. So through the years, you can see that we've been ramping up in terms of our number of applications. So 230 this year, 80 were admitted, 41 visited, and then we ended up with uh, 26 uh, people here. Um, these are the statistics of the years. You can see 20% in terms of female, 10% uh, currently in terms of student of color. I was surprised about the international component because, uh, you know, across the, the country and across our um, university, there is the Trump effect that international students are not, are not coming to the US as much. Now, the reason why that ratio has dropped recently is because of this large um, outflux of our graduate students. And, and that's very healthy. That is, like I said, due to all of these great things that we're instigating. And I know when you look at the um, graduate handbook, it talks about requirements and exams, and it sounds like we're policing. We're not. These are ways to help people and make sure that they don't go adrift, that they will get to graduation in a reasonable time. I including a whole lot of things, but I wanna thank everyone who was involved in the recent orientation week last week. So Francesco, Lane, Eric, Ragu, and Billy. I know there's always a balance between preparing people for teaching, preparing people for research, and you know it's an evolving process and we'll get it right. But there is no doubt that this is much better than previously. Um, teaching, you know, remember the days when we used to graduate dinosaurs, those were the good old days. You know, if we just look at some of the images from last year, clearly his, his Graham's physics of climbing, here's a typical kind of scene from a well, I'm at a hall with active learning, clearly things are going to be changing. Here is our curriculum committee. I want to thank Brian Boggs for agreeing to chair uh, the committee. Let's step back before we talk about pandemic. Let's talk about pre-pandemic for a moment. So um, within our college, um, I've worked with two deans and they all use 2007 as their sort of comparator for two reasons. Initially, it was that that was the year before the crash. And so it was a sort of way of judging have we recovered. But the other big thing is that in 2007, the, the university made a decision that it was going to ramp up its student population gradually from 20 to 25K. So they want to look, as the student numbers increase, they want to see how much resource is it taking. So that ratio then, undergraduate student credit hours, 1.15, so it's increasing. TTF FTE though is increasing bigger, 1.25, NTTF FTE 1.46, and GE FTE 1.38. So if you hear vague talk from the dean that you know the resources are going up relative to how much we're teaching, the dean is clearly looking at those numbers. It's, it's not giving the full picture because what also happened from 2007, if we look at who was hired, the, there was a bias towards the natural sciences, which is really good. The workhorse of student credit hours is social sciences. Natural sciences are just more intensive in terms of the resources because of labs and because of progressive things like our mentoring of co-teaching and things like that. So of course, um, you know, we don't look as good on paper and we have to defend it. Let's have a look at uh, what we're doing. So green is now, this is our fall enrollment. So in physics 201, one of our big service courses, you can see that we're, we're no different before that we're, we're holding uh, and the same with 204. Here's our 100 level. Okay, so 
Uh, you can see that massive peak in uh, 2019 fall. That's because of Dean and Jens, uh, where they had massive enrollments. But the interesting thing is looking at the spring, that those numbers are similar to before. You know, so we're clearly doing okay in terms of numbers. I don't know about quality of the teaching, but of course, you know, everybody's taking a dip in quality right now, and that will improve. Uh, astronomy, look, uh, 733, that's the Scott effect, Scott taught in Columbia 150 last year. But again, looking at the spring numbers, they're not different from the past. What about our majors, right? So lots of, lots of reasons why not to do a physics major, but more reasons to do uh, a physics major. So let's look at that. Let's look at our numbers, right? So let's ignore the green columns. Those are the, um, the student credit hours. Let's look at the numbers, right? So the yellow is the total number of physics majors that we have. And the red is the number of graduating, right? So we're, we're reasonably solid on the number graduating around about 35 each year. And our incoming majors this year is 39. Um, we do have to worry about that drop. We don't want that to go uh, in the yellow line because that, that shows that we have retention issues. We don't want it to go uh, below 150. And I'll return to that in a moment. In terms of a greater context though, because this last year Tyson Hall, which is the big advising endeavor has kicked into action uh, with a capacity of advising uh, 1,500 students per week. Oh. Now, the reason for this is because the U of O is, um, it, it's not unusual, but it, it's, a, it's a distinction. And it might be something that we want to uh, regard as an opportunity. So 25% of incoming U of O students are exploring. They've not declared their major yet. And over 50% of U of O students changed their major. So that means there are students out there that we can convince to do physics. It's not straightforward because of our, you know, our sequence of events, because the way it is at the moment, they have to get in fairly early. Let's have a look at summer session. A big thank you to Stan, who was the summer session director, and all of the people who taught uh, during the summer. Because initially it was quite chaotic where we were only allowed to run courses if they were gonna be profitable. And that meant that we had to wait and watch our enrollment numbers creep up to 24, and then suddenly everything was okay. So you know, a lot of patience and flexibility displayed by all of these people. I want to show you the numbers, though, which are uh, quite amazing. So 2019 and 2020. So look at the massive increase of mm -hmm. the number of students who uh, were enrolled over the summer, 995. Okay, a lot of hard work. And um, I want to thank everybody who was involved in that. In terms of the future, uh, and now actually, not so much the future, thanks to Stan for installing the learning glass. Um, these, these are open for you uh, to help with. Um, Dietrich is our one HyFlex uh, user at the moment, so that means that uh, simultaneously remote and in person. And, and this is a photo of Dietrich today. Um, Thank you, Dietrich, for your patience. Uh, the technology wasn't quite as good as it could have been. In, uh, it's, getting better. it's getting better. It looked better today than on Tuesday. So the gradient is right. You look great. And uh, so your next challenge, of course, is making sure that the students behave themselves and remain safe. Um, Ray and Scott, and actually Billy, uh, Giant, and Stan also uh, attended the Provost workshop over the summer to convert um, the remote to uh, online classes. And so um, Ray and Scott will be doing um, online uh, astro courses uh, this term. Uh, let's remember our heritage that David won a great prize for all of his work in STEM active learning. And that of course is continuing. If you remember, we had a provost workshop um, last fall uh, if you look there, you know, we had Scott, we had Dean, Benjamin and myself attending. And Dean is, is a big leader in this. And one of the things is to close that gap between um, 
white peers and underrepresented groups. Opportunities for the future um, in terms of spreading our influence. <laughs> it sounds like world domination, but we, we should be doing it. So the data science major has just launched. Uh, the initial enrollment of 12 is expected, but they're expecting a lot of majors to come in from elsewhere. So this is gonna grow. And we are next in line in terms of developing the theme, uh, whatever they call it, they switched the name, the theme domain. Okay, and uh, neuroscience major, that might be an opportunity for us. So that got launched this fall uh, with an initial enrollment of 10, but that's gonna rapidly escalate. General physics, and I mean that uh, in terms of the 250 and 200 level, those are great opportunities for us. So. Uh, ben McMurrin will be teaching uh, this in the Honours College this fall, and we've committed to be teaching it in the Knight Campus in the future. But of course, that is the future. The big challenges for the Curriculum Committee, then, as I'm assuming the, the teaching assignments now will be conducted with Dean within the Curriculum Committee, um, I'm assuming that you will all want your teaching assignments to stay reasonably stable. I don't think you'll be wanting to change. Um, equity of teaching loads is a big issue for our climate, but we might have to delay that because of just the workload. We wanna get it right. So the big thing I think will be retention of our majors. If you remember, there's the issue about faculty mentoring individual students. We should look at the timing of the Physics 250 series. Do we need to reintroduce tracks? That's probably a question for the future. And of course, we've all, always got to think about the math skills. But clearly, the curriculum committee has to decide on its priorities. The personnel committee and the post-tenure committee, in terms of third year and sixth year reviews, those have to go ahead. Those are mandated. But we will be hearing from the provost in terms of rules about how to accommodate uh, the fact that people's performances might be different in the modern era, and also how to slim down the size of the reports to take the pressure off in terms of the time absorption. So we have no choice on those third and six year reviews. Those are mandated. Where we do have local discussion is on PC scores. Okay, And I've asked the PC to consider, start to think about um, how should we be evaluating our faculty? How often? And what sh how should we communicate the results? And what I mean by communication is how much mentoring do we attach to those numbers? And of course, nobody wants to be a number. But in the end, when there's a merit rise, we are required to give a number to the college where they convert it to a salary. Faculty and Student Awards Committee, you might say, well, maybe we should tone that down, but actually I think the opposite. I think we need that more than ever. Um, partly, you know, if there's no cash, no salary, you know, increase of salary to give people, then maybe awards are really useful. But also remember that particularly in terms of our graduate student awards, they do often come with GE positions. So these are very, very useful to us. And, and finally, David is um, the chair of um, the Alumni and Development Committee. Again, you might think, and I'll have to have a conversation with David about this, you might think, well, maybe that's one thing that we can pause right now, but maybe not. Maybe that is a great way of networking and donations. And there are donations out there. So we've, we've received two uh, donations in the last year, adding up to close to 100K. So, you know, we'll have to have these sort of discussions. So um, final slide, you know, I know that these are unusual times. Um, I can definitely answer any questions that you want about our budget. Like I say, at the moment, we're locally looking stable, but I hope you've seen, you know, the numbers that I've seen in terms of our teaching enrollments. And I know that's different from quality, but the numbers, the tuition dollars do translate into our stability. And the research you're all doing, you're, you're extraordinarily talented anyway, and I'm extremely lucky to be your department head, but um, I am seeing no changes in your excellence there. 
Anyway, uh, that is it for the moment. Like I say, Dean has been uh, monitoring the chat. And so he's actually going to be sort of in charge of the, the questions. Um, equally, just raise your hand and uh, I'll try and answer any questions that I can right now. And we'll definitely be taking notes in terms of uh, things that we can answer in the future. Okay, so thank you for listening. And are there questions? Thanks. I'd, I'd ask that people uh, raise their hands using the little, um, what is it called here? <laughs> Reactions thing. And then that'll bubble you up at the top and I can call on you. There weren't any real questions that I didn't see cropped up in the chat. So questions for Richard. I've stunned you. Ah, okay. Well, I, did, I, I did raise my hand. You know, well, first, in case people don't know, the raise hand thing is in the participants button, not in the reactions. Um, and uh, yeah, so sure. is it really the case that we don't know like university enrollment numbers? Well, they're just uh, unstable, right? So at the moment, what they did is they changed all of their penalties. So there's no penalties of withdrawal at the moment. So students might be coming in and testing the situation. And then any time up to um, early uh, you know, November, they can actually decide to withdraw at any time. So that's where, that's where uh, they will know the enrollment now, it's just they don't know whether it means anything. Mm. But it's presumably an upper bound on what the enrollment is. And do we, do we know what that is? I actually don't know what the numbers are. So mm. I, I think it was looking at a 10% drop when we talked to the provost two weeks ago. So there was a kind of alignment, like I mentioned, between Boulder and here, and it right. was around about 10%. Um, you're right though, that of course, it's gonna be highly unlikely that someone's gonna enroll. Right. After this day. Yeah. So it's gonna go down and not go up. Cool, thank you. Any other questions for Richard? Raghu, how did you raise your hand? <laughs> I'm confused now. <laughs> yeah, so if you click on the participants button at the bottom, um, you'll see in the tabs of the little window that pops up, you know, raise hand. I need to lower my hand, I guess, um, there. So not in reactions. Okay, not in reactions. Thank you. So is, is John Tona still with us? I just want to make sure that he was um, reasonably happy with my non-answer earlier actually, on. Actually, actually, so isn't, Richard, isn't part of the answer that we cannot use foundation funds for operational expenses? I think, I think in normal circumstances, you can't do that. I think, you know, so much is unusual at the moment, um, but I, I think that that's some of it. I think, I don't know the answer to this question about if, if the enrollment drops and um, let's say uh, it starts to head into that category where we spend more than $20 million by doing um, faculty savings. What, I, what I've not been told yet is what are the options? What, what is the uh, university gonna do about it? And of course they can't, we can't do things like sell buildings and, and things like that. Um, so I, I, I really don't, I, you know, there's been no discussion of that yet, but, but it has been optimistic based on the numbers that they have said that they're expecting that the salary cuts will not come in in November. They will come in um, next summer. That's because the state cuts are not going to hit on the next summer. That's, that's right. Okay. That's right. Any other questions for Richard? Uh, Eric, you asked a question a while ago. Um, I don't know if you wanted to repose that question. It looks like Dave Strom has one. So I don't know if Eric's still with us and wants to ask that. Uh, okay, maybe not. Let's move on to Dave, David Strom. Yeah, so um, I mean, just to channel John Toner here. <laughs> um, I mean, the uh, obviously, we're extremely exposed on the athletic side. What is the, um, I mean, how, how do they deal with that? They borrow money? Um, they, they being the athletics department. 
Is what? That... Well, I mean, the athletics is part of the university, right? So right. we're. I right know that we're, no. we're. I know that there's a a wall, in terms of budgeting, but I mean that's an artificial wall. If the athletic department goes broke, they can't go separately bankrupt from us, right? <laughs> Um, um, I mean, I, I understand the salary cuts. I'm not yeah. totally against them, so, but I'm just curious what what mechanism do they foresee to to do that, and is there a danger yeah. that so, some failures on the uh, athletic side could bring down yeah. the whole university? Absolutely. So all that I what I can tell you, you can imagine that you know I know certain things, and then there's certain things that um, well, there's a lot of things I don't know. Um, but what I know is that two weeks ago, uh, Patrick Phillips told all the department heads that there was not going to be, that that financial wall was going to stay. And so th that's what I know. Now, you might say that that's extreme. You might say, well, what if the athletics department collapses? Well, you know, we just don't know, right? That, and, and that was my sort of answer to Dietrich as well, that, you know, I, I don't think it's, hopefully the students are gonna buy into things and that, you know, that we will be able to deliver quality education and you know, the, the, the numbers will stay up. If they start to decline, I think it's great that we've decided to take a uniform cut across all the faculties. And that, that was such an obvious target. Um, and you know, I don't wanna talk about doomsday situations, but I, I do wanna point out that, um, it's not impossible, you know, that, that I could see a situation where that, that, um, that wall remains firm, you know, and this is way above a department heads level of discussion. Okay, do we have any other questions for Richard? Uh, if you're unable to figure out how to raise your hand, I think you can just jump in and we'll hear you. You know, and I just want to say, you know, what I have not talked about is all the testing and everything. Uh, the reason for that is it's, it's, it's kind of, you get the same news that we get. Um, even the Dean doesn't get any advanced news usually in terms of that. So you know as much testing as me. You know, my understanding is that they've got a capacity of now of ability to um, test 800 people and that the turnaround now is, is 12 hours and that they're expecting some sort of massive quantum leap in uh, late October, where they'll have the capacity to test anybody, you know, so that, that means any faculty member, because, you know, we've got this weird situation at the moment of testing incoming students, but then a faculty member can go and teach them without being tested. So, you know, I know as much uh, about the testing as you, as you do right now. It looks like Eric Corman does have a question. Eric. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, the question is, you had mentioned that um, the college or the university is likely to take our excess money, our surplus. Yeah. Well, Should we well, spend that down? I mean, yeah. I, I feel <laughs> like, you know, there are plenty of things that we as a department could really, really benefit from. And if it's going to be taken from us, I think so we should spend it. What I can tell you you can do is that any money in your ASA accounts now you can spend. It's the incoming ASA that they're discussing. No, but you had you had suggested money more than just the ASA, departmental yeah. funds. Yeah. So when I say they come knocking at the door, um, you know, I don't know what that will look like. But remember, we we are trying to keep our you know, I'm, I'm trying not to use dramatic language here, but we are trying to keep our university moving forward. And we, we, to an extent, have to be good citizens. If there's debt acquiring centrally and we're saving, then we should be good citizens. I guess we have different opinions on, on that, perhaps, but... Well, well, let me just paint it another way. If the university collapses, What's our department going to do without a university? Although, again, to, to channel John, there are a lot more options for the university to raise money than just Absolutely. taking it from us. But if we have that surplus, they can take it. 
if we don't have that surplus, they can't. Yeah. Let, let me reassure you, Eric, you know, um, I'm, I'm painting the, the angel here, right? I, I want you to know that in CAS meetings, I am defending our budget. Sure. Right? So you can imagine that with, you know, 30 departments in our college, when the dean makes an announcement, even a week ago, when the dean made an announcement about the ASA potential to pause it, there was an amazing amount of discussion. So I don't want you to think that, um, you know, Bruce is going to come knocking on the door and I'll just hand him the cash. You know, he's, he's going to have to come up with, uh, you know, because that's what the dean does, right? They've got to come up with a very considered policy. Okay. But what's probably also true is if there are cuts coming, then they'll, they'll cut whether or not we just spent a huge amount or not. I mean, I'm <laughs> very surprised if uh, the, the magnitude of the cut for a specific department depended on the, on the balance sheet. That yeah. tends not to happen. Yeah, no, that, that would get too controversial. Any other questions for Richard? And remember, I, I know that we covered an awful lot of ground today. And so, you know, we're going to be having a faculty meeting, a meeting with the staff. I'll be meeting with the graduate students. So, you know, it, it's not even about have you got a specific question. It's just so that we can meet and uh, questions will come up. Um, and, you know, we're in an evolving situation. Each week we, we're going to hear a little bit more about enrollment and things like that. And um, you know, I'm obviously going to be keeping you up to date with everything and uh, be seeking your input. I'm, I'm not going to do anything radical without your input, um, is the good news. Okay, I think I'd just like to say that I will circulate the uh, link to the cloud recording of this uh, to all the faculty and the grad students and, and anybody else who, who would like it. Uh, I don't know if Richard, if you're going to turn your slides into a PDF and put those in a place where people can get at them as well. Yeah, you know what I'll do is I'll I'll strip all the Hollywood out of them and keep keep all the basic facts and I'll make those uh, PowerPoints available to you. And I just want to emphasize, talking to other department heads, um, how you know we've got a big department and it's complex, but I am so lucky that you are so energetic and talented. Talking to other department heads, they have far bigger problems than I have. And I'm hoping that you keep this last slide for us, Richard, because I need to make a print out <laughs> of it and put it on my wall or something like that. <laughs> uh, no, it shows my best side, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And thanks, thanks Richard. Richard. Thanks, thank Richard. Thank you very much, everybody. Nice to see everybody too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think we peaked out at 102 people I saw at one point. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, about 102. That's right. Yeah. That's great. All right. Take care. Take care. See you guys. Bye bye.